Hello, everyone, and welcome to another Embark ERS Lessons in Practices webinar. My name is Professor Michal Steinberg. I'm a professor of Israel, interest in bronchiectasis and adult CF. And this webinar series is together by Embark, the European Bronchiectasis Collaboration, intended for everyone um, interested to learn more about bronchiectasis care. Today's topic is the evidence base and regular treatment of bronchitis, and it will be presented by Dr. Andrea Garmega from Milan, with Peter Homini from um, St. Nicholas, Belgium, as the discussant. Before I hand over some housekeeping notes, um, please use the Q&A option to place questions and comments. And there are translations available. Um, we'll share the, the slide uh, for that soon. Uh, so please use the captions option at the bottom of the screen. If you're using a translation, be sure to drop us a comment about the translation quality, um, also indicating the target language. So with this, I'm happy to hand over to uh, Peter Homini. He's a respiratory physician from St. Nicholas in Belgium and a member of Embark Management. Peter is leading um, a leading expert in bronchiectasis and is currently also leading the Embark Scientific Committee. So please go ahead, Peter. Thank you, Michal, for this kind introduction and thank you for the invitation to chair this session, which is a, a session on a topic that is often not tackled because it's stable bronchiectasis. So the patient is stable. So do we need to do anything? And is there any evidence and any practical points that we can learn the people what to do during stable disease? Well, of course, stable disease gives us opportunities and also some questions. Is there actually some evidence? And I think to tackle all these questions and all the opportunities you have during uh, an outpatient clinic where you see an, a stable patient, we have an excellent speaker, uh, Andrea Gramegna from Università della Studi di Milano. Um, he is an assistant professor uh, in Milan, uh, specialized in bronchiectasis. You all know his name, obviously, and also an adult CF. I think he's the chair also from the ERS uh, adult CF section which is a new section in the uh, in um, the ers and he will tackle today some really interesting points on stable bronchiectasis so andrea the floor is yours thank you thank you peter for the kind presentation give me a feedback if you can see my uh, screen we can see your screen okay Maybe yes. Now yeah, that we see the presentation, Andrea. Very well. And uh, my task today will be to uh, talk with you about uh, uh, some practical aspects and uh, evidence-based uh, issues in in the treatment, in the clinical management of stable bronchiectasis, uh, as as Peter uh, has introduced. And uh, I would like to start from this uh, uh, overview of the clinical management of bronchiectasis that you may have known from some previous webinars. As you see, this is a sort of chart that we can use to standardize and to, uh, to see as an helicopter view what we usually do uh, during clinics. And uh, I will go through some aspects in what we do when the patient is stable. So I'm not, I, I won't talk about uh, etiological screening and the start of uh, um, and, and the first clinical encounter. And I won't talk about pulmonary exacerbations. Um, First, let me uh, clarify that I use two different types of sources in, uh, um, for this lecture. Uh, one source is uh, uh, what we know from the ERS guidelines on the clinical management of adult bronchiectasis. So it's a sort of uh, um, uh, evidence-based, uh, uh, it's a list of evidence-based statements uh, that were issued uh, uh, by the Respiratory Society in 2017. Uh, and uh, we know that some uh, update is going to to be uh, issued in in the next uh, in the next uh, years. But uh, it's important also to say that we must acknowledge that uh, most of the statement in these guidelines are based on expert opinion because we have uh, uh, we we have not a 
strong uh, bundle of evidence for uh, bronchiectasis management since many of the clinical trials uh, we, run in the, we have run in the last years failed to meet uh, the primary endpoints. That was true at least for this first uh, uh, issue of the, of the guidelines. And the second, and the second uh, source that I used to uh, put together this presentation um, is the uh, 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 real life uh, 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 a real life data. Uh, we have a lot of uh, prospective studies, observational prospective studies about bronchiectasis, single center, multi center courts, um, a lot of coming from uh, previous experience as the friends data set. But uh, um, I think that most of the, the most rel reliable and the most high quality evidence come from this uh, publication that is uh, the, 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 the publication of the uh, EMBARC data. Uh, so a huge uh, data set, a uh, huge uh, um, uh, registry of uh, about 17,000 individuals. Uh, uh, that is a strong documentation about um, what we know in bronchiectasis, at least in European countries uh, and the countries that take part in these studies in terms of geographical variation, microbiology, uh, and clinical impact and severity of disease and also uh, outcomes and clinical management. Well, and coming back to this slide, the first uh, the first issue, the first uh, chapter I would I would like to discuss with you is the what we do during uh, stable state when the patient uh, meet us during 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 clinical encounters in terms of trying to understand a bit. Uh, um, deeper what, um, what kind of clinical presentation and clinical uh, um, outcomes the patient may have in terms of uh, severity assessment and understanding uh, the clinical phenotypes. Uh, I, will, I will spend a few words about uh, this uh, classification in clinical phenotypes that is not also useful in terms of fostering research, discuss, uh, discussion with experts and uh, uh, publishing papers, but it's relevant also for clinical issues because we know that clinical phenotypes are a lot. Uh, we have, uh, um, we, can, we can read through uh, uh, papers that uh, we have uh, bronchiectasis associated with other conditions. So we have uh, bronchiectasis and, and COPD, bronchiectasis and immunodeficiencies, uh, as well as um, other uh, clinical uh, clustering, other clinical phenotypes. But uh, in my view, what we, uh, the more clinical, the more clinical, the more practical aspects in terms of uh, phenotyping our patients is to ask ourselves if our patients are, if the patients sit behind, sit in front of us is a frequent exacerbators or a frequent exacerbators with a pseudomonas chronic infection. This is very, uh, helpful because we can understand uh, some something about um, treatable traits of this, of these patients and also clinical clinical outcomes. We can understand if this patient is a, is a patient that is going to have worse clinical outcomes, and so if he needs if he uh, if we uh, have to uh, invest in terms of uh, uh, treatments and uh, um, uh, frequency of, of, of uh, um, clinical, uh, clinical visits. Uh, so the identification of clinical phenotypes, this is the first message that is, in my view, is very is, it's relevant. The first uh, uh, message is the, that the identification of clinical phenotypes is really helpful in terms of uh, um, clinical practice. And, the, the, the phenotype of the frequent exacerbator is uh, uh, one of the worst in terms of uh, impact of the disease uh, on patients' quality of life and respiratory symptoms, uh, uh, long-term clinical outcomes and uh, healthcare costs. Because we know that exacerbations are one of the main driver of disease progression. And we know also that if one patient is a frequent exacerbator and we use the threshold of three or more exacerbation in the previous 12 months as um, 
standardized definition for these uh, frequent exacerbators. Well, if a patient is a frequent exacerbator, he may uh, keep this uh, clinical behavior over time, and so is going to have worse clinical outcomes. And we know that this is a problem even more acute, even more uh, burdensome in the case uh, the patient has both clean and frequent exacerbations and um, pseudomonas originosa chronic infection. That data about mortality and disease progression um, on, uh, of patients with uh, uh, one of these features are quite consistent and are quite strong. And so we can understand your unstable state by collecting a strong um, clinical history of the patient if our patients, if, if this patient is going to uh, to have some troubles from some some clinical um, some, some troubles from the from from its uh, uh, from his uh, or her situation, and uh, another reason why, in my view, is relevant to focus our attention on this phenotype identification is that these phenotypes are treatable uh, traits in bronchiectasis, at least uh, according to the last uh, uh, to, to the to, to the first uh, guidelines, the U.S. guidelines. Uh, um, on, on, this, on the clinical management of bronchiectasis. We know that if a patient is a frequent exacerbator, we can address exacerbations with chronic uh, treatment, as in the case of uh, macrolide treatment uh, or long-term inhaled antibiotic treatment. And these treatments are not treatment of the pulmonary exacerbation itself, but these, these treatments are to treat the phenotype, to treat these frequency of this, this worse control of uh, inflammatory infective um, chronic condition of the patients. And so we can use both uh, either or, bo or both of these treatments according to this, uh, this, this figure that uh, um, was published uh, within the guideline document and that give us freedom to choose uh, um, to choose between uh, different uh, these two different um, chronic uh, uh, therapies, uh, an anti-inflammatory macrolide approach or an anti-infective antibi inhaled antibiotic treatment. And in this case, I'm, I'm I, I would like to ask you. Uh, um, your, op your, your opinion about uh, this uh, clinical situation. Uh, let's figure a woman, 64 years of age, with idiopathic bronchiectasis. So she already underwent uh, a first level um, etiological screening with a history of at least five pulmonary exacerbation uh, this year. Uh, this, this patient, this, uh, this woman, um, uh, does very well is daily airway clearance with PEEP bottle. Um, she was trained uh, during the first clinical encounters at our clinics, and she had uh, a sputum uh, a chron a chronic um, finding of Haemophilus influenzae, so a chronic infection or colonization uh, of Haemophilus influ by Haemophilus influenzae on sputum on sputum culture in different. Uh, in different occasions. Uh, this is the first question, the first case for you. What uh, option uh, would you prefer uh, to um, address this uh, challenging clinical situation of frequency, uh, of frequent exacerbations in a patient with both uh, um, Etiological, etiolo a first level etiological screening done and uh, a training for airway clearance techniques. So daily uh, chest physio. This is a quite common uh, situation in our clinics, at least if you work in a context uh, uh, taking care of bronchiectasis patient, frequent exacerbation is one of the most challenging and most common uh, situation you may find. Well, let me 
wait for your answers so we can spend some comment. And okay, uh, there's a problem I think with the yeah, polling. Those were zero percent for each for, for yeah each, each answer. I think it's because we have the four polls at the same time, and so we need one poll at a time. I think, but uh, maybe while they are fixing the the polling questions, maybe we can just go to the uh, discussion of the result of the, the case or what, what the different possibilities are, uh, Andrea? Yeah, I think, uh, I think that we can, we, we are quite free to do, uh, um, to, to, to choose for each of these questions. There is no wrong question and a right question uh, because we can reassess airway clearance, reassess adherence, uh, and go into further etiological testing if, if we want to uh, know, uh, uh, to better know the situation, to better know patients' uh, adherence and behaviors. But in my view, uh, this situation asks to uh, um, some sort of, uh, of treatment as soon as possible, because we know that uh, high frequency of pulmonary exacerbations is uh, something that is going to lead the patient to worse uh, clinical outcomes and impaired quality of life. So um, I think that we can choose between uh, some long-term treatment and if we stand with the guidelines, this patient has no pseudomonal chronic infection, so probably long-term macrolide is the best the better option among the among the two, but uh, we can also ask in the same time for a reevaluation of sputum microbiology because we can suspect uh, that uh, some new infection um, has occurred. So a new infection may appear during stable state um, in bronchiectasis, and uh, uh, so probably it's wise to move. Uh, uh, through the different, through several levels. But my view is that we can ask mm, new tests in order to start a chronic, uh, a chronic treatment. And if we choose uh, chronic macrolides, I, I feel quite comfortable when I uh, choose chronic macrolide treatment in a patient with a, a history of frequent pulmonary exacerbations. This is typically something that we choose during stable state, but in a patient with these uh, frequent uh, exacerbator, exacerbator phenotype, because uh, it's one of the, the, the therapeutical options that in, in bronchiectasis clinical management is stronger in terms of uh, uh, published evidence and uh, uh, clinical evidence. Uh, this is a sum up of the three more most 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 important most. Uh, historically relevant uh, uh, clinical trials about the use of um, macrolides in um, frequent exacerbators. And we, 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 we see that uh, patients in azithromycin or erythromycin, different drugs, different schemes, uh, have some benefits in terms of reduction of pulmonary exacerbation or uh, they have longer, longer, mm, longer uh, period to till to the next exacerbations. But we know also from more recent evaluation, more recent studies and patient-based meta-analysis that this strategy is also helpful in the case of pseudomonas chronic infection. So at the time the, the, the guidelines were issued, probably um, the, the evidence was, uh, uh, the evidences were stronger for uh, chronic macrolides in patients with no pseudomonas. And, but now we, we know that we can use this option. And this is quite common in my clinical practice. I'm, I'm curious to hear about, uh, about that from Peter's experience, but uh, it's a quite common option to use uh, uh, chronic macrolides, even in the case of pseudomonas chronic yes. infection. So, so yeah, I, I can certainly corroborate what you're saying. We know that 
the macrolides also work in terms of uh, intervention with quorum sensing, which is the communication between the bacteria. It disrupts quorum sensing. It works on the pili of the pseudomonas, so disrupting mobility, motility of the pseudomonas. So it's certainly relevant. I wanted to pop in a question as well because be during because of the problems with the first case B, and there's no questions yet from the audience. But I had a question. So you nicely showed the blue journal paper from 2018 from uh, from uh, James, where where we know that frequent exacerbator phenotype in bronchiectasis is, is consistent over time and that shows really high disease severity, poor quality of life and increased mortality. Even if you see a reduction of exacerbation frequency, you still see that these people are more frequent exacerbators than other patients. So at what point would you introduce macrolides? I know the studies talk about and the guidelines about three or more exacerbations, but you rightfully say that if there's pseudomonas that you can even consider at a, at a lower number of exacerbations. What for you is the ideal or the most um, uh, practical time to introduce macrolides? Um, I, I will give you a very practical answer that is uh, um, from uh, my daily practice and um, it's very important that we uh, know the patients well in order that to understand that the patients define an apolmonary exacerbation if as something real because we usually uh, can uh, we usually can um, uh, target uh, a patient with a frequent exacerbation phenotype if if uh, the patient had a lot of antibiotics in the previous year but after a few visits after a few uh, a more uh, a deeper understanding of what an exacerbation is and what uh, the stable state is for that patient. So stable state is a chronic sputum, is a greenish sputum, and the patient must understand it's a stable, his uh, stable state. Then after this is clear, maybe the number of uh, um, exacerbation in terms of number of antibiotic courses may decrease uh, in the next year. So it's very relevant that the patient has a, uh, has a strong, uh, understanding of its stable state and of its uh, his exacerbation phase in order to be sure that we target these patients with a frequent exacerbator phenotype only if, if they are really frequent exacerbators. And then another very important things to do before talking about inhaled antibiotics or, he, or chronic macrolides is to, to, to standardize airway clearance for that patient. So it's important that the patients, that the, those patients had uh, uh, consistent training for chest physio and maybe a retraining uh, after a few months. And they had also a, an individualized approach for airway clearance techniques. For some patients is ABC, for, is, for some patient is uh, pep, pep battle or maybe something more. We can use also non-invasive ventilation if the patient has a poor, uh, um, a poor FEV1 and uh, or the or the use of uh, muco active adjuncts. So when the patient is optimized is optimized in terms of self knowledge, self uh, management, and uh, chest physio, then it's. Uh, our definition of, 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 of frequent exacerbator phenotype is really more consistent and more reliable. And then we uh, can discuss the, the, the start of long-term treatments because they have also a lot of adverse events and maybe some concerns uh, with in, in, in a more tailored, in a more precise uh, um, way. So it's not something that I usually do in the first visits, but it's something that I can do following the, the patients for at least a few months. Yeah. So I'm I, I'm am I right to say that because the topic is now bron stable bronchiectasis, that uh, frequent exacerbators remain at risk of frequent exacerbations even if they present at your patient clinic with stable bronchiectasis, and therefore you should always think about. Uh, pseudomonas and, and macrolides and depending on, as you said, the whole history and the uh, extra elements, right? Yeah, this is a typical decision that we do during stable state. Uh, I, I won't start any of these long-term treatment during a pulmonary exacerbation and the definition of these phenotypes is, is something that it's, I, I think, one of the most relevant uh, decisions that we can 
take during stable state, uh, from, during the traditional follow-up. Okay. So it's about uh, exacerbation, but not it's not the, uh, the acute episode, but a clinical phenotype that is consistent over months and years. And we have the tools to better understand and to target this uh, behavior, this clinical aspect during uh, follow-up, during the traditional follow-up. Okay. And uh, if we have now the, the pulse fixed, but we, we well, let's try, uh, I would like to understand from you if, uh, uh, what is your choice? What is your, your, your option in the case of uh, frequent exacerbator with chronic uh, pseudomonas originosa? Because now in my view, we have more options, but I know that uh, availability of treatments and uh, uh, can can vary uh, across countries. So uh, in this case, I uh, I think that we may have different point of view, uh, and so we can opt for a more watchful wait uh, approach, or we can start during stable state a long term treatment, either antibiotic or anti-inflammatory treatment. So let's see if the problem is fixed. It should be fixed normally. Yes. Yes, so the answer is very it, it, it is very fragmented. I think it's a, uh, it's a good uh, uh, start for discussion because we have 50% uh, of attendants that would like to go for a reevaluation of sputum microbiology and maybe at the same time uh, to uh, 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 long term treatment and inhale aminoglycosides is uh, uh, more voted than long-term macrolide. I think this can be a reflection also of availability of inhaled antibiotics in your clinical uh, uh, settings. In my case, it's very difficult to go for inhaled treatment if the patient has no rare disease. So it's easy if the patient has a bronchiectasis with some etiology, as in the case of PCD or immunodeficiency is very difficult in the case of idiopathic bronchiectasis. And so long-term macrolide in my personal experience is more used, uh, even in the case of pseudomonal exacerbation. And as Peter said, we have strong uh, biological and translational data uh, to do that. But as, you, as, as a, a quarter of you said, I think it's also very important to reassess airway clearance. And this is another very good option that we can uh, do during stable state because we have enough time to reassess some etiology or in this case to reassess uh, airway clearance technique. And I think I will go for both of these answers, um, long-term treatment and uh, reassess uh, the, the, the and optimize uh, error clearance technique. Well, um, as many of you may have thought during during uh, this answer, uh, chronic macrolides are not free from uh, some concerns. Uh, we know that in the case of bronchiectasis, we uh, we deal with patients with uh, older age and uh, uh, a lot of other drugs, some comorbidities and a higher risk of non-tuberculous mycobacteria. Uh, and so that is another quite common phenotype. And so uh, I think it's right to say, it's wise to say that before starting any of this treatment, in this case, macrolide chronic treatment, we should be, uh, we should assess some, uh, some risk in order to decrease the risk of adverse events. And so uh, we usually assess patients for some organ function, uh, liver function tests, and uh, 
uh, an EKG uh, is quite common in order to avoid the risk of um, uh, increase of liver function test and uh, uh, prolonged uh, QT uh, and so cardiovascular risk. But we should be also very careful about drug-drug interaction. It is common in uh, patients with bronchiectasis because they usually have some anti-hypertensive, uh, anti um, cholesterol and uh, maybe uh, some uh, psychiatric uh, drugs ongoing. This is very typical for the older age. The risk of non-tuberculous mycobacteria is very serious because we, at least in my case, about 5-8% of patients with uh, bronchiectasis have some positive findings for NTM. And so we should assess if a patient, sputum culture for patients with uh, uh, frequent exacerbation, not only to avoid new infection, but also to be sure that we can start uh, mac chronic macrolide treatment uh, in the absence of NNTM uh, infection, because we know that macrolide are uh, a common drug, uh, the, the keystone drug in the clinical management of uh, NNTM pulmonary disease. And uh, so this is my next question. I think it's one of the most common situation that we may find uh, in the case as, as, as a contraindication or as a concern in the case of uh, a long-term macrolide treatment. Uh, what would you do in the case of a stable patient, maybe thanks to a, a macrolides, where we found uh, um, NTM, in this case, uh, a rapid growth NTM in, in uh, the sputum culture? While we are letting the people uh, make their choices there is a question for you andrea in the chat why is there and certainly this is relevant because you are also a cf expert why is there a higher risk of ntm in these patients if they watch to avoid environmental acquisition yeah this is a, this is not easy to to answer because we know that we have uh, at least two type of risk factors the first is bronchiectasis itself uh, so host factors, because bronchiectasis are a sort, in my view, are a sort of um, a local um, immunitary dysfunction and airway clearance dysfunction. So it's easier for people breathing uh, NTM that are ubiquitous, so we can find in the environment. It's easier to have some chronic uh, uh, infection, and in some case, this chronic infection may develop into a pulmonary disease. So uh, bronchiectasis are the most uh, relevant. Bronchiectasis as an anatomical as an anatomical um, alteration is the most is the strongest risk factor for NTM um, acquisition. And then we may have so, also some etiology that is more at risk of NTM, as in the case of immunitary dysfunction or uh, immunodeficiency or, or real immunodeficiencies. A lot of patients with bronchiectasis may have bronchiectasis and NTM secondary to some uh, immunosuppressants or some uh, immu immunomodulant drugs that they are taking for another, another disease or concomitant conditions. Some authors suspect that NTM may be also uh, an etiology of bronchiectasis, and it's still difficult uh, to, uh, to answer the question of the chicken and egg in the case of NTM and bronchiectasis. So in some case, you may find uh, physicians uh, talking uh, of NTM as a, a, a common etiology of bronchiectasis. Yes, it's not it's not easy to avoid NTM in the environment. And as you said, there is a lot of unknown uh, things as well. For example, there are interferon gamma autoantibodies that are predisposing factors for NTM infection, and we don't check them for all patients. So there's underlying conditions that make a patient prone to NTM as well. Um, I don't see a, a sixth uh, option, and before we go to the results, maybe we can discuss on that, is what do you do, and this is referring back to the latest Embark data that were published in the Lancet Respiratory Medicine, what, did you, what do you do with the overwhelming use of ICS when you have suddenly a MAC in surveillance? Yes, this is another uh, very important thing to do during stable state. In some cases, we should recheck uh, treatments, and we know that ICS 
uh, may be a risk factors for NTM and NTM pulmonary disease. And in most of cases, we don't have real reason to uh, treat our patients with bronchiectasis with ICS. We know that I will, I will show you some uh, slides in, uh, uh, at the end of this uh, lecture, but uh, uh, we know that uh, bronchodilators and ICS are not uh, chronically uh, suggested for people with bronchiectasis unless they have concomitant obstructive condition as asthma or COPD that may deserve these uh, ICS medications. And uh, from CF and bronchiectasis data, we know that ICS may be harmful. So in some cases, it's used, it may be useful to consider uh, an ICS withdrawal. And, and we have the answers from case three now. You can see the answer, and uh, I see that a uh, slight majority of people opt for uh, one of, uh, I, think, I think, a strong option, that is to reevaluate um, the patients in terms of criteria for NTMPD. Uh, and so um, they will ask for a new chest CT and check for NTMPD. Uh, but there is a strong uh, an alpha of, of, of the attendance going for a retest uh, for sputum for a retest for sputum uh, NTM sputum culture in the case of a contamination that is something that I don't know Peter may happen so mm -hmm. absolutely I, I think I, I would certainly not I would try to avoid to, uh, to uh, because I see change low dose macrolides in therapeutic dosage I would avoid trying to treat the patients with monotherapy macrolides because mm -hmm. inducing resistance is a very a very serious concern. So that's the reason why Andrea has put in stop macrolides in there because I think that is something that is relevant in waiting if it's contamination and if it's not contamination, waiting if it's NTMPD indeed, and then further looking into resistance patterns and, and treatment. Yeah, I think th this is a strong message. Avoid uh, the use of a single drug in NTMPD and maybe consider stop macrolides. And uh, just to, to uh, uh, move a step forward in the discussion about what we do, do what we do during stable state, uh, check sputum culture and control uh, for new infections, for new respiratory infection is a very relevant uh, uh, step in, uh, in, uh, mark in um, uh, cl during clinical encounters. Uh, we know that uh, most of our germs, especially Pseudomonas originosa, might follow this Pseudomonas paradigm. That is that we may have a first uh, bacterial infection, in this case, a first Pseudomonas infection, that we may, that we may, that we may check with uh, sputum culture. And this uh, first infection in, in the next months and years may, um, uh, may uh, be reassessed and may uh, chronicize in uh, coming uh, to the final chronic infection that is a very uh, different condition from the first uh, uh, an early infection because in this case pseudomonas but we know also other germs may develop uh, mucoid phenotypes that is to say that they may produce biofilm and they may become more resistant to antibiotics and this makes uh, germs more difficult to, to, to be treated and impossible to be eradicated. So uh, in consideration of this paradigm that is very strong in CF, but we know we have data also in bronchiectasis, uh, we may um, uh, be concerned about the risk of chronic infection. That is not only for Pseudomonas, as you see in this chart from the uh, Embark data set. Pseudomonas is the most common germ with, uh, uh, which is able to give a chronic infection, but also Haemophilus influenza is very common. Maybe uh, Pseudomonas is more common in the Southern Europe, while Haemophilus influenza is high in the is high in prevalence in Northern Europe, but also Enterobacteriaceae and stuff our overs may, may give a, a chronic infection. And so to check for, to check for a new infection is relevant because in some cases we can opt for eradication. And this is the case of a man of 34 years old, 
uh, with primary ciliary dyskinesia, so a genetic uh, etiology for uh, diffuse bronchiectasis that is very well thought in uh, his uh, daily airway clearance and with a story of chronic MSSA, a, a multisensitive st staph arrows that uh, in the last sputum culture uh, uh, is positive for Pseudomonas aeruginosa. And this is a very uh, uh, common condition that we may find during stable state bronchiectasis. The patient in this case is not exacerbated, is not during an acute phase, and we may decide what to do with uh, these last, uh, uh, with these last uh, uh, microbiological findings. We can retest sputum microbiology, uh, we can decide uh, to treat the patients and uh, we have different options of treatment. So uh, this is another very relevant chapter in uh, stable state bronchiectasis this, that is period periodically to periodically reassess sputum microbiology in order to avoid or minimize the risk of chronic uh, infections and also in this case, uh, we may find a treatable trait in, uh, uh, in the clinical management of our patient. So this, this question really boils down to the question, in a stable patient who is under uh, optimal treatment, you suddenly find during sputum surveillance a pseudomonas aeruginosa in a patient with MSSA, what do we do? Do we eradicate or do we wait until the patient has an exacerbation or do we intensify maybe other treatment or we re retest? So let's see what the results are, Kara, if it's possible. Yes. The majority wants to eradicate, Andrea. Yes, I, I think it's a uh in some sense a good message because they they find that uh, this is not something that we should uh, ignore or we should be aware that uh, this is a risky situation and a potential uh, uh, treatable traits in uh, our uh, clinic in the clinical management of the patient i think that most of patient we most of attendants would vote to for an eradication maybe uh, vote also for a retest uh, uh, for retest uh, microbiology, uh, we can do both of uh, both. We can do both of these these options, but eradication is uh, a good option and is very is very uh, uh, is suggested by also uh, the uh, ERES guidelines on bronchiectasis management in the case of a new isolation of Pseudomonas aeruginosa. As you see, we have different options to eradicate or try to eradicate. Uh, the pathogen, uh, but uh, in most of cases, you will combine uh, a systemic treatment, either or both uh, oral and uh, uh, intravenous uh, anti pseudomonas antibiotics uh, for a short phase with a long uh, phase, at least three, three months of an inhaled antibiotic treatment. This is the clue of uh, um, uh, the eradication approach uh, to Pseudomonas aeruginosa, most of this uh, um, uh, this statement is mostly based on expert opinion and uh, few data from uh, very small, um, uh, at, at least at that time, very uh, small studies. But probably we have now more, uh, we will have more evidence about uh, the inhale antibiotic approach, even in the case of bronchiectasis, we, should, we can do a huge discussion about uh, why this is so common in CF and this is so difficult to be demonstrated in bronchiectasis, but I fear that is a bit out of topic. But it's right to, uh, to, 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 to stress that in this case, we can go for an eradication and uh, you may see here the most commonly used regimens uh, at least according to the last uh, um, uh, guidelines uh, on this topic. Yeah, as you say, it's expert opinion. So I think the people who, who do a watchful waiting approach are maybe not wrong if you follow up the patient, he's purely stable and you do a reculturing and you're being very attentive. Uh, 
and I because there's so little evidence on the superiority of trying to eradicate versus watchful waiting, I think that's also a feasible path to follow as long as you follow up the patient closely. And the reason why the expert opinion was very keen on trying to eradicate is because we know that from many data that once you have pseudomonas in many patients, that is uh, a negative effect on morbidity and mortality. But we do feel that some patients spontaneously clear apparently pseudomonas and some people stay stable even without trying to eradicate. So probably there's some heterogeneity, but for the majority, I think uh, eradicating is a, is a good idea. Yeah, I, I agree with, with, with you. And then I will spend a few um, words about control lung function. That is something that we should uh, consider in patients with a chronic respiratory condition, as in the case of bronchiectasis. We know that bronchiectasis is not a, a chronic obstructive condition uh, by itself, as in the case of, uh, for instance, COPD. Uh, we know that uh, many patients may have both an obstructive and restrictive disease. Many may have a diffusion impairment due to mucus plugs, and we have also a uh, significant uh, uh, percentage of patients, it's about 10% in this small single center, uh, multi center study from Italy, but uh, we have uh, uh, about uh, uh, 9 10% of patients that may have normal lung function, uh, even in the case of diffuse uh, clinically significant bronchiectasis. This is one of the reasons why we don't have uh, uh, valid randomized control trials. Uh, uh, identified in these two Cochrane uh, papers uh, uh, to, um, to study the effects, safety and efficacy of the two most common bronchodilators, beta-2 agonist and anticholinergic treatments. And this is also the reason why uh, the guidelines did, did not, don't recommend the routine offering of long-acting bronchodilators for patients with bronchiectasis, uh, and we may consider to uh, prescribe these patients with bronchodilators in the case they have a huge burden of respiratory symptoms, especially breathlessness, and on an individual basis. So this is a sort of um, prescription for symptoms, and so it's a very weak recommendation and we should consider and reconsider if this uh, uh, prescription is helpful for our patients in a, a sort of individualized approach. But we know that bronchodilators may be uh, helpful in the case uh, um, in the case of chest physiotherapy and in order to optimize um, uh, airway clearance effects. Uh, this is a, a sort of a best practice and in, in my view it's mostly imported from CF care, but we can prescribe patients with bronchodilators before they do airway clearance technique in order to optimize uh, results uh, in terms of, of, uh, of uh, um, in terms of airway clearance, and at the same time we can consider bronchodilators if the patient uh, is prescribed with some inhaled drugs, as in the case of inhaled antibiotic treatment, in order to increase tolerability. Because in some cases we may have FEV1 reduction, FEV1 drop. Uh, if a patient is exposed to uh, inhaled antibiotics and uh, pre, uh, the pre, um, to treat with bronchodilators before um, delivering these, uh, these, uh, these treatments may be helpful in, in order to keep uh, treatments well tolerated for longer uh, for a longer time as in the case of uh, i don't know eradication or uh, inhaled antibiotics uh, in the case of uh, a suppressive uh, chronic uh, inhaled treatment so please consider uh, bronchodilators but this is not the, something that we should mm, offer to um, every patient we see in clinics and reassess pulmonary function tested during stable state is very relevant in order to 
prescribe only in the case we uh, the patient really need uh, these drugs. And another very important feature in uh, another very important chapter in what we do during stable state is assess and re chronically reassess, periodically reassess adherence. Adherence is so relevant for people with a chronic condition, and this is not different for people with bronchiectasis. We have issue of adherence in bronchiectasis, as in the case of uh, CF, asthma, and COPD, and other chronic condition, even outside the respiratory field. We know that adherence to chronic uh, uh, drugs is very low, uh, as in, as you see in this case, in this report where we have uh, uh, the authors documented and reported adherence to inhaled uh, antibiotics and other respiratory medicine uh, uh, about 50% and also uh, even less in the case of every clearance technique that is really the, uh, the one of the pillar of the stable state in uh, management in bronchiectasis. So reassess and reinforce uh, adherence is really important in bronchiectasis. And we can do that during stable state because we have time enough to focus some aspects in uh, uh, adherence. We know that adherence is a very complex, is a very difficult um, uh, aspect. Uh, it, it, it is probably a multifactorial model where, where we should better understand uh, what are the most common barriers limiting adherence and we have the typical five five stars five point, points approach um, suggested by the WHO organization so please uh, um, investigate treatment related uh, factors disease related factors and also personal factors that may affect uh, adherence uh, in, that may be different from one patient to another. Uh, we don't have a lot of studies about adherence in people with bronchiectasis. In this case, we uh, the data are still uh, in, in scarce, but we know from some uh, report, from some prospective studies, that uh, we have uh, some factors may weigh more than, than others, as in the case of these uh, um, uh, observational studies reporting a huge weight, uh, a huge weight, a huge role uh, to limit adherence in, uh, in the case of uh, um, and, and investigate factors limiting adherence. We have predictors for this situation in the case of age and also burden of treatment. We know that age is one of the most limiting factors for adherence, one of the most relevant barriers. And this is relevant if you think that bronchiectasis is a problem, especially for the older age. And so most of our patients uh, are more than 60 and uh, most of our patients are prescribed with a lot of drugs. And we know that uh, there, this is a, there is a, this second vicious vortex in bronchiectasis, uh, that is the adherence vicious vortex. More a patient is, uh, more we increase treatment in one patient, maybe because it's deteriorating, uh, more adherence dec is decreased. And uh, uh, things for a, for, for, a, for a while to our patients with uh, bronchiectasis and older age, they probably have uh, a lot of pres prescriptions ongoing. And if we increase treatments, that may be very burdensome, as in the case of uh, chest physio or inhaled uh, uh, antibiotics. This, is, this may be very difficult to uh, follow, especially for those patients with uh, disease progression, severe bronchiectasis, or persistent symptoms, despite standard of care, that are the, the, the group of patients where we uh, are most likely to increase with our uh, therapeutical pressure. So please consider uh, and reconsider adherence in these patients because if we prescribe but the patient is not compliant enough, uh, this, is, uh, this is not use, useful but pot potentially harmful for the patients and the system. And so uh, stable state is the best moment where can, we can identify some potential barrier, better inform the patients about uh, 
safety of our medications and uh, uh, try to provide support. In this case, uh, patients association and um, uh, patient association and other uh, organization can be very helpful because they can collaborate also thanks to patient-patient communication with our efforts. And then we have a last aspect that I would like to mention in the case of comorbid, in the case of uh, sta stable state reevaluation of patient, that is comorbidities. We know that in the case of stable state, we have uh, opportunities to reevaluate comorbidities in our patients, and we know that comorbidities are very common in people with bronchiectasis, uh, and we have also tools to evaluate. Uh, the, real, uh, the real burden of bronchiectasis is one of the most useful tools in this case is the BACI score. That is a score that can give a different weight to different comorbidities in relation with the mortality. And so it's, it can be very helpful to understand uh, which comorbidities can, can have a major, a more relevant clinical impact on our patients. And uh, uh, so this, of course, opens to uh, a multidisciplinary approach where we should uh, consider a shared um, management of our patient, as in the case of malignancies or other chronic condition, as in the case of chronic inflammatory disease. So please reconsider comorbidities and give to each comorbidities a different uh, prognostic impact, a prognostic score in order to understand if the patient deserves to be shared with other, with other specialists. And uh, this is uh, my final slides to um, re-stress the, 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 this useful chart for the, the overall uh, clinical management of people with bronchiectasis during stable state. Thank you. Thank you so much, Andrea, for this excellent presentation and some really interesting cases and discussions. Um, I think Michal also posed a question um, so uh, she asked, for example, you have a patient and it's a frequent exacerbator. So we know for the future, it's a patient at risk for frequent exacerbations. You've started with airway clearance technique. The patient is better. He comes back after a few months and he says, well, I'm, I've tapered down my airway clearance techniques because I feel better because of your treatment. And then the patient gets a new exacerbation. Would you try to, you know, put the pressure on doing more airway clearance or would you start a macrolide? Because sometimes people rather take a pill than do 15 minutes, 20 minutes airway clearance every day. Yeah. So as you, as you mentioned, we can have different etiologies of, of exacerbation. And in some case, uh, exacerbation can come from a, a, a not uh, adequate uh, clearance techniques. Uh, we should um, uh, share with patients how hairy clearance techniques are uh, a long life treatment. It's a sort of uh, um, it's, it, it substitution is to um, uh, use and techniques to uh, in, instead of the impaired clearance that they they, they have due to bronchiectasis. It's so it's something that they should uh, continue for most of their time. We can use also some different approach, trying to individualize the chest physio, at least in this case, maybe the, if the patient is young, he may be uh, more uh, prone to do uh, um, exercise and some sports that can be a, a useful, um, uh, helpful uh, strategy in order to decrease the burden of some worrisome and burdensome uh, airway clearance, but in the case that we can't improve the patient airway clearance in patient enough, or if the patient simply change their behavior because they got some new infection, well, in this case, we can reconsider uh, indication for chronic treatment. In my view, chronic, chronic treatment is not uh, uh, something good to for patients because we have a lot of adverse event and uh, maybe some concerns. And in some case, the patient try, try to taper down also chronic treatment. And so when I 
when I prescribe a treatment is for some period is uh, okay we can try with macrolide because we tried all the other options and it's in, it, it, they are not enough and we can consider it for six or 12 months and then reconsider in some ways we in some case I use some um, pause in in the chronic macrolide treatment uh, uh, that may be seasonal in the case the patient is more prone to exacerbate maybe during winter time this is not true for uh, always true but uh, we can individualize these polls for for each individual and the, the idea is uh, try to get the best to hit the best with the lower amount of chronic drugs but improve clearance or reassess clear clearance techniques is my top of the pyramid in terms of chronic management. I, I fully agree. Uh, I really like the point about, you know, the surveillance and the lung function and the re rechecking of treatments, whether you could stop certain inhalation treatments. Um, in terms of comorbidities, I know even in stable state, you don't always have enough time to tackle all of these things that you mentioned now. So what is the role of the GP uh, here? Do you try to um, inform the GP that the comorbidity section is actually maybe something that they could take on, checking for osteoporosis, periodontal disease, cardiovascular disease, etc.? Yeah, it, it, it can be very, vary a lot according to your setting. In some setting, the GP is really strong, is really the case manager for patients uh, or the, 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 re, the, the assessment of um, common uh, comorbidities is very well standardized. In some other case, especially in the case of severe patients, you as the bronchiectosis physician may become the case manager for that patient. And so in that case, I have uh, a more... CF-like approach, trying to take care of also of extra respiratory comorbidities, especially those strictly related to um, bronchiectasis as, uh, as, uh, as a consequence of chronic inflammation. And so osteoporosis and uh, cardiovascular disease are one of the main, the, the, my personal main concerns. Okay, thank you so much. I think, uh, thank you for this excellent session, Andrea. Thank you uh, again for the excellent lecture. I think um, Michal Steinberg wants to uh, give us some updates on the next dates. Yeah, and that's the, the final slide that is showing on the screen. So thank you very much, Andrea and Peter, for a wonderful discussion and very practical to our day-to-day um, -day life. Uh, the next uh, session in the series is about the diagnostics of PCD with Emily Howison and Amelia Schumark as discussants, and it will be on the 20th of September. So we will announce before, and please register and, uh, and visit, and also visit the Embark website for uh, recordings of previous um, uh, webinars that are available. So thank you very much, and have a wonderful summer. Uh, and see you back in September. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.